start that over for continuity and posterity. Um, this assignment is the same as last assignment, with the exception that there are, or that we are having a concentration on different aspects of things. So, whereas last assignment, I wanted you to create ugh, just a constant fight. The first part of your assignment last week was to create an artificial environment. This week, I would like you to create a natural environment. Now, impress me with your retention of knowledge and justify my existence in the universe. What is a natural environment? What would be the key characteristics of a natural environment? Non-symmetry and spontaneity. Okay, so. A variety. Asymmetrical. Great, All right, so we get variety. Right, so the more variety of size, shape, design, spacing, right, and then color value, right, et cetera, the better, right? So as much variety in this as possible. Asymmetry, that goes along quite nicely with it as well, right? And specifically, asymmetry in terms of where your focal area is going to be. Right, so that focal area, I mean, AKA breathing space, AKA staging area, right? All of this stuff is synonymous with each other. And that conspicuously empty space you're gonna design your environment so that it's off to one side of the frame or the other as a way of accentuating this natural environment, right? So the same way that I would become less conspicuously a focal point than if I was centered in a frame like this, if I just kind of like slide myself off center like this, I mean, it starts to become a little bit more naturalized. Right? And what kind of perspective would we be using? One point or two point? Two point. Two point. Two point. Fantastic. Okay, so those are going to be your characteristics of the environment that you're going to do this week. Secondarily, uh, or a second part of your assignment, you're going to draw a focal point. That focal point can be anything you want. It doesn't matter. Um, and just as in last week, this natural environment is going to have a frame around it, as is usual. This does not have to have a frame around it. And then part three of your assignment, just like last week, you're smashing this thing into that thing and giving me a combined version of it. Okay, so we revisit this towards the end of class, but this is your assignment for this week. And this class is essentially just unpacking a different aspect of it. How do we control not only the environment, right, but also the focal area and the focal point so that those things highlight each other right, in the sense that it becomes obvious when you're looking at a picture, what's most important in that picture and then cascading degrees of importance inside that picture as well. Okay, so you can screenshot this, right, but again, we'll revisit this and this will become more and more apparent as to what it is that, um, we're talking about while we go through this. Now, as I mentioned before, there are a number of different ways of developing focus. Again, impress me. How, are you, how can you develop focus? You can have the lines pointing towards something. Okay, so with using perspective, how would we use perspective to do that? Uh, put what we want focus at like the center point. Okay, so your one point vanishing point creates directional focus. Okay, so that's a really good way of creating or creating a sense of or creating a sense of uh, attention for an object. What's another way? The positioning. Positioning, where do we put stuff that's important? In the middle. Okay, but what can't we do this time? Put it in the middle. Okay, so our focal area is gonna be someplace different. So even though central positioning is one way of creating focus, we're not doing that this week. 
Now we can still take that one point vanishing point. And even though we're doing the entire picture in two point, say that the entire environment is set up in two point, I can still have my one point vanishing point asymmetrically positioned inside the frame so that I can create an environment that looks something like this, for instance, say that if I'm dealing with, you know, again, some sort of street scene. I can still have a one point vanishing point associated with you know, a vehicle that's along that central line. Right? So I can have this conspicuously empty space on one side of the frame and I can have my vanishing point directly in the center of the frame as well. Now, the way that we've oriented or the, rather the way that I've oriented this vanishing point in relationship to these two points is different than what I've done. This would be reflective of the jump points that I've mentioned obliquely beforehand. But even if I didn't do that, say it just pushed this vanishing point out further over here, I could still do the exact same thing. Right? The only difference we, between say this and this is that these two vanishing points indicate objects at 45 degree angles with less distortion. These two vanishing points equal objects that are not at 45 degree angles and would have a little bit more distortion. Okay, so this is something that I can clarify with you guys um, individually if you're interested in it, but not something that you need to concern yourself too much about right now. Point being, if, if you want to create a picture that has this vanishing point asymmetrically located, you just change the position of the frame in relationship to it so that you can still draw your whole picture in two point, but you can draw a portion of the picture that's going to be associated with a focal point in relationship to that object using that vanishing point. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, but why is our uh, object using only one point? Like, why is it not using the two point? Well, because if you use your two point, well, I mean, you could use the two point. You could put that. You could put that thing in here. Like, you could put a two point object in here just as easily, and it being aligned right on top of this, right? Or even if you put it, like, if I just put a random object back here in two point. That would still be a focal point in two point, but it would still be in front of a one point. So you could do either or. Right? I'm just using a one point object there, right? Because there's also been questions in the past. It's like, well, how do you blend one point and two point together? This is an effective way of doing both. Mm, okay. That makes sense? Yeah. And if you want to put the focus on the two point, you have to put it on the central position of the one point. You just have to put it again someplace along this axis. On the vertical, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It'll be more apparent if you put it directly over top of that vanishing point, but it'll still gather attention if you put it along that axis that's associated with that center of vision. Okay. Okay, so you're going to have to use this, right? And you're going to align that focal point with your focal area, the empty space asymmetrically inside your frame. Okay, so that's another characteristic of, um, of your assignment. Now, what we're also going to add is other ways of developing focus. Okay, so again, these are two ways. The other ways that we're going to introduce are isolation. Okay, and as a way of accentuating that isolation, a sense of uniqueness. Okay, so when something becomes isolated from its background, and that's why this breathing space, staging area, staging area focal area, empty space becomes so important, it effectively makes that object feel like it's more powerful. It makes it feel more powerful in the sense that it's able to control its own space. Like it pushes things away from people. Can you imagine like just to personify it again. Think of somebody who is like a geologic proportion, spend a ton of time in the gym, right? And they can just like push shit away from it, right? Indefinitely, wherever it is that they go, right? They have all of this area around, 
this is why it's like everybody feels so unimportant when you're like rammed on a bus or a subway or something like that, where you're just kind of like, you have no breathing space at all. You know, you just, like, everything's compressed. So we want to isolate right, something that's a focal point as a way of identifying its overall structural importance. And that will also in turn make it unique. And essentially what we're doing here, and this is gonna be a key consideration for us from this point forward, is how do you overlap objects? Right now we're, we're using overlap as a way of creating a convincing sense of depth, but we can also use overlap as a way of accentuating and depreciating a sense of importance as well. So as a simple as a simple example of that, I brought props this time. Cards, you see fairies, lovely. Did you guys ever see the uh, the mask logo that BC Fairies got so much shit for? No. No. <laughs> I love it when shit like this happens because graphic designers are particularly bad for having some sort of like god complex. I talk to a lot of graphic designers. It's like, I know everything about design. And you're fools for not recognizing the importance of the strength and control that I have over imagery. Right? Well, when shit goes wrong with designers, it's super funny, right? Because then you get to fucking poke at them right, for this. Basically, they were designing a, uh, they designed a mask right at the beginning of COVID or designed a logo right at the beginning of COVID to obviously underline the importance of wearing masks in public and on the ferries. Um, well, let's just say is like that if you turn this, um, if you turn the, if you turn the, um, the design in a particular direction, it looks like an entirely different part of the anatomy, shall we say. <laughs> this made international news. It was great. <laughs> I highly encourage you to look it up. Anyway. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> the fact that that got greenlit and it made it through a room full of executives that said, hey, yeah, that's a great idea and nobody caught it is remarkable. You, you, you don't even need to turn it. You can see it on the spot. Yeah, it's immediate. When I first, when somebody first showed it to me, uh, I, was, I was like, this is a fucking joke, right? And I'm like, no, nope, that's that's a real thing now. I love, I also love, I also love the CEO's response of, B, of BC Ferries, the CEO's response to it when he was questioned about it. He's like, well, Everybody's going to remember to wear a mask. <laughs> Remarkably successful piece of graphic capturing people's attention. Okay, so what we're effectively doing when we're doing this, all of this stuff, is something called the image hierarchy. So you can literally list or you can literally organize objects in terms of how they overlap each other to dictate not only these things here, right, but also this thing here. So as a simple example, one really easy way of creating focus, as we've already gone over, is doing this, right, putting shit in the middle of the frame. Right? Now, this is a really easy example because there's nothing else to pay attention to, right? So all I'm really doing is taking advantage of the fact that I put this thing in the middle of the frame as opposed to, say, putting it up over here. And putting this thing here as opposed to there makes that thing feel more important. Now, what if I do this? Which one of those things is more important? The center one? The center one, why? Because it's in the middle. Because it's in the middle. Right, so easy or easy answer. They got, they've all got the same presentation. They're all identical. There's nothing that separates them, other than the fact that that thing, right, is centrally positioned. Now, what happens if I do this? Now, which one's more important? The one that's sideways. The one that's sideways. Why? Because it's different than the other two. Because it's different. So this is what uniqueness does. Right, uniqueness basically overwhelms or overrides position, right, in terms of focus, right? So there's multiple different ways of creating focus, but certain things we recognize as being more reflective of importance than other things, right? So this is where the tricky part comes in, right? In the sense that, well, how do I want to develop focus, right? And what things are gonna overwhelm 
the natural psychological predispositions that we have towards identifying things as being more important or less important. Right? There's nothing tricky about it in terms of your ability to immediately recognize that this thing's more important. The tricky thing is understanding that as an image creator and then being able to pull those things out and apply them right, to the pictures that you're creating. So if I then went ahead and do, did this, now which one's important? The middle one. The middle one, right? And you see how it automatically amplifies right, in terms of its obviousness of it being important. Right? Because now it's got two characteristics. It's got a right, central positioning and it's got a, a sense of uniqueness attached to it. Okay, so that's a really easy way right, of identifying right, what's you're using things right, in terms of their positioning and their isolation, right, also their uniqueness as a way of creating focus. Now, what, have, what if I did this? Now, which one of those things is more important? The one on the, uh, the one that's by itself on the side. Okay, why is that? Because it's lonely, so it's. Okay, well, let's, let's change that. So what about if I did that? The one on the top. Okay, so there's something about position inside the frame, right, that makes things feel more important as well. Now, what if I did this? Which thing's more important? The two together. Okay, which single object is more important? The one by itself. Okay, so this becomes more important as a group. This becomes more important right, as a single object. Right? As if so, if we're trying to identify a single object that's important as opposed to a group of things that's important, when I start to isolate something, that thing becomes even more important. Now, let's say that I go back to this original example. And now I start doing shit like this. Now, which one's more important? The one in the middle that doesn't have anything on it. The one in the middle. Now, what if I move that thing up over here? Which one's more important? Same one. Oh, M1, right? So that isolation, right? This conspicuously empty space here, that's your focal area. That's your breathing space, that's your staging area. That's, right, and you're setting up that empty space with the intention of say, if you had, say that, this, say that there was a scene, right? That you were exposed to, right? And that scene looks something like this, just a simple overhead, simple overhead camera, right? And you've got a collection of, I'm drawing that. I'm going to murder you. Does not want to cooperate with me. Right? And that simple scene is going to be right? a character is going to come in. Let's just say that these are all documents, right? Or it's a poker table or whatever. Let's say a character is going to come in, a hand is going to enter into frame, right? And that hand, right, is going to. <laughs> I'm so fucking irritated with this thing right now. Hold on a second. I need a paperwork. Okay. All right, and that hand, right, is going to put a card, put another card someplace. Your job is to raise the anticipation in the viewer that that card is going to be placed in a particular spot. <clears throat> Where is that? Where is that card going to be put? The empty space on top of. Yeah. Right. So when the card comes into frame, or when the hand comes into frame, and places a focal point there, we automatically know that that space is where we're supposed to be looking, even though we're not, even though it's not occupied by anything. So you're designing your first environment, right, in a way that allows all of the other structural components, say. Mm -hmm the empty space, the directional lines, right, et cetera, to direct focus towards this empty space with the expectation that it's gonna be filled. So that when it's filled, that object that fills, it just takes advantage of what's already happening inside that space, as opposed to it being, say, innately important in and of itself. Okay, so that's what we would call, say, a structural decision inside of a picture, right? Where you're arranging the picture in an abstract way as a way of, 
identifying what's going to be more important than other things right before you ever get to that point now how that relates to what i've just called the image hierarchy i uh, so I forget how to spell higher arc e great the image hierarchy is that in, there's lots of different ways of talking about this as well, right? So we can have an image hierarchy of position. Mm -hmm. For example, right? So things in the center of the frame feel more important than things right towards the edges of the, or towards the edges of the frame. We can have an image or we can have an image hierarchy of uniqueness. Right, where the more that you have of a particular thing, the less value that that particular thing seems to have to us, right? The repetition of something basically sucks out the individual nature or the individual value of that. Think of like a unique article of clothing, right? As opposed to a mass produced article of, of clothing. When we get to it, right? You can have an image hierarchy of contrast, both of value and in terms of color. And so you can start to dedicate how important something is based on its relationship to a level of contrast. Right? And then you can also have a, an image hierarchy in terms of isolation. Right? And this has specifically to do with what we would call the silhouette of an object. Now, the first class of the second term, we're going to spend the entire class talking about just that right there. Right? And for right now, this in this class, even though this is these are other ways of creating right, a sense of focus and an image hierarchy, all we're concerned about right now is this for this class. Right? And you can think about this as having essentially three different, or sorry, four different categories. Right? And these all have to do with how an object is overlapped. So let's say we take that same that same scene, okay? and I put one of those cards here, another one of those cards there. Let's change a little bit, and then another one of those cards there. Now, what a silhouette is, right? Is if I draw around that card, that's what that card silhouette is. Right? It's just the exterior boundary of that line or of that object. Right? And all objects fall into this category, right? So if I was to draw a hand, my hand has a silhouette to it. Because of reasons that we'll go over in next class, is like your brain responds most easily to general patterns like this. It recognizes those general patterns first, recognizes details second. And we're very, very, very good at doing this. Right? And the reason that this is important for us is that figure ground relationship that we went over last day. We can basically recognize the difference between figure and ground, something in front of another thing, in like a fraction of a millisecond. We're incredibly good at doing that perceptually we're much we're much slower in terms of rec registering detail which means that we need more time to be exposed to certain things right in order for those things to make sense so if you want to relate that say immediacy of impact what we're trying to do with a focal point in terms of taking advantage of our ability to separate figure from ground focal point from environment environment immediately what we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for your brain to do what it does naturally, right? Which is register that thing that's some, as much or as important as possible for the picture because we've designed that picture in such a way. So if I was to ask you which one of these things was more important, which one of those things is more important? Ignore the double image here. Call these card A, B, and C.
So if there's any sort of confusion about it, right, it's because it's not designed clearly. Right? It should be immediately apparent, right, what it is that is more important than another thing. So if I did this, then put another card in here and another card in behind here and called that D and E. Now, which card's more important? A. A, becomes immediate, immediately apparent, right? So that is the top of your image hierarchy. That's why that empty space is so important. There's nothing in behind it. There's nothing in front of it, right? So with this, the silhouette of your object is entirely isolated. And it's isolated inside that empty space. I will be referring to it as breathing space, right? From this point forward. Right? So those empty spaces that you're creating inside the first picture of your sequence is in anticipation of putting that or that isolated silhouette inside. Now, what we're going to do next class is essentially talk about how to make this thing as recognizable as possible. For right now, your point or your what you're trying to do is associate this part of that image hierarchy with your focal point. Great. So the first level of your image hierarchy is associated with your focal point. Everything else, as a way of accentuating the focal point, is associated with your environment, right? Because now it's not only important enough to control this, but we also have to control the environment because your brain's just, it's just a fucking goldfish. It's just swimming around looking for bright, shiny shit to pay attention to. And then to a large extent, we don't necessarily know why your brain pays attention to a lot of things, right? I mean, we know, right, because we're going through this, right? And a lot of this is based on what a bunch of cranky Germans at the beginning of the 20th century, right, kind of unpacked as laws, rules, guidelines as to how the brain works, right, in terms of patterns that it recognizes. It's called Gestalt or psychology, which is either a worm for form or pattern. I can never remember what, right? So we're very good at recognizing patterns. And what we're taking advantage of is about, you know, at this point, about 100, 100 years of psychological testing that seems to prove these laws as being close enough to a capital T truth that we could take advantage of them, right? In terms of imaging without having to worry too much about their second decimal place accuracy. Okay, so when we start to get into a position like this where I'm overlapping an object over top of another one, these objects, B and C, start to take on a second order of importance, right? Where you can think about these as overlapping another object, right? That object and that object are more important than the objects that they overlapped because I can still see the entirety of those objects, but their silhouette is disrupted by another object that's in behind them. Whereas if an object is overlapped, right? those objects, D and E, become even less important. Right? And then if we just needed to kind of like fill space, I could take these objects and cluster them in and around the frame, even if it was just for compositional value to make the frame seem a little bit more full. Those objects are then cropped by the frame. So I'm literally dictating the order of importance that your audience is reading and associating importance with and set for objects inside your frame. Now, this isn't so sexy if we're talking about this in relationship to cards, right? Because I mean, who really gives a shit for that matter, right? But the point being is that this same sort of psychological registration of importance holds true whether or not these are cards, people, anything in the universe, right? So the important part would be say, Let's associate this with people. This is where the stars of your show go. You paid good money, right, in terms of a streaming service or going to a movie theater or whatever the case may be to see that person act. So this is the way that those people are treated. They're basically essential to the story, right? You can't understand the story unless you understand what's happening with that person. They're doing important things, saying important things, et cetera. Right? So that's where your leading lady, leading man, right, leading person goes. 
this secondary, this is your sidekick, so to speak. They're still essential to the plot. We get some background information about them. We know them personally. They're just not as important as this person. These characters, mechanic number three, scene two. You have no idea what that person's name is, doesn't matter. They're a stock character. They've got no real personality to them. Depending on the genre of the film that you're dealing with, they're probably gonna get killed relatively quickly and nobody's gonna give a shit about it, right? So they're just there as a device to kind of like move the plot forward because we need bodies there. These background extras, blurry, right? You could replace them with plants, right? Unless you needed a, cl a crowd scene, right? There are no individual importance. They serve no, fun or they serve no function to the plot other than providing bodies to create a crowd scene or something like that. They're literally just background. They're not important enough even to show the entirety of them in the frame, right? So this has a narrative device attached to it. I wish I could remember what the name of this movie was because it was really successful. It's been years now and I've never been able to discover it rediscover it so that where they use this as a narrative device to show the show the journey of a central character from a point where they were really insecure unconfident right kind of mousy crawled inside themselves and even though you knew that the story was about them right from the beginning because the dialogue was all about them was always referring to them right they were always following that character there was always they were always out here right peripheral to the or peripheral to the center of the frame tucked in behind people, cropped by the frame. And you got the visual sense that this character wasn't important. And then as this movie went on, the movie is essentially about a movie about self-realization, self-discovery, et cetera, discovering your own inner sense of power right, and confidence. That character gradually migrated towards the center of the frame and then is shown like this, right? As a nice visual way of underscoring that trajectory that that person's gone psychologically. Right? and showing that in a very easy to understand visual form. Okay, so all of this stuff is what you're gonna have to do for your environment. Right? Is that I want all of the objects inside of your environment to be overlapped, overlapping, or cropped by the frame because your brain is gonna associate importance to an object regardless of where you put it, if it shares this kind of silhouette value. So, if I was, for example, to do a version of your assignment, and this omen will go to a certain extent to help to answer your question as to why you might do this a focal point in one point. If the entire environment is going to be more in two point, what's going to help to make that object stand out more? One point or two point? Well, one point will give a sense of uniqueness. Exactly, right? So I wanna put whatever that object is. Right? And let's just say for continuity with the assignment that, that that object is one point. Right? Now, if I'm gonna put that on a street corner, okay, there's a building. That building's cropped by the frame. That makes it easy to understand that it's not important. So is any sort of doorway that I'm putting on that frame or on that building or any sort of window that's on that building. Now, if I'm gonna put another building over here. That building, just by virtue of doing that, right, because it's an entire entity, that doesn't have right, some sort of right, increased value because it's physically cropped by the frame again. However, if I did this, you see how that door starts to become a, a competing point of attention. Right, because now that door physically becomes a frame and an object of focus for something potentially else. And it's also in the center of the frame. So little things like this go a long way. If you know that there is an increased attraction to the center of the frame, you can decide not to put something in the center of the frame. Like I can get rid of that door 
and put that door over here as a way of making it seem a little less important. But if I wanted to depreciate that door's importance, the only thing I want to share this characteristic here is that. So maybe now I put a mailbox over top of that door and that overlaps the door that's in behind it. Likewise, maybe I put a parking meter there. Now those things overlap, but it does so less successfully because you see how that door starts to frame the top of that parking meter. So now maybe rather than doing that, maybe I take a doorway or, an or that door and open the door. So now that there's a sliver of door that's open there, or maybe I do something like put a motorbike right in, in front of there or lean a bike up against that. There. It doesn't really matter what those objects are. What I'm doing is essentially developing the frame so that I, with an awareness that objects that don't or that have this sense of a silhouette to them, that isolation are gonna automatically attract more attention. So if I put a window right up over here, I want to design that those windows so that maybe they're propped out by the frame. And then vice versa, or the same over here. So common ways of like making this, making things go weird. Let's say that you know you've got a, a distant highway going off into the undiscovered hinterlands. Well, an easy way of making this drawing go sideways is just like, all right, well, there's a sun in the sky, so let's just put a sun in the sky. That immediately starts to attract attention because now it's isolated. So if I wanna get rid of that, maybe I put a cloud over top of it. And so that doesn't seem so weird. I put another cloud someplace else. If I wanted to put in something like a tree over here, you see how that's problematic now. Right, because now this has its own frame over there, its own space. This has its own space and it has a central vanishing point that it's associated to. But now this, what your brain is trying to do is, it, your brain is basically trying to make sense of the patterns that it's good at, sent, or good at recognizing. So what your brain is naturally doing at this point is like, all right, well, what does this tree and that truck or, and that vehicle have to do with each other? Is this thing gonna just like drunkenly wheel around the corner and smash into that thing? Right, is, you know, it's like a squirrel gonna pop down out of this tree, run across the road, this thing's gonna turn the corner and squish the squirrel, right? Whatever, it's like your, your brain's trying to make a narrative out of this. So what we're in the business of doing is trying to control the narrative. So if I don't want that tree to be important, easy way of making it less important is just put another tree in behind it right? and then disrupt its silhouette or, you know, put another, another cloud in behind it, et cetera, et cetera. So if I want a character that is maybe sitting on a street corner, waiting for a ride from this character here, simply by putting that character on this street corner and disrupting their silhouette makes that character less important than that. I can, also, uh, I can also further disrupt that silhouette by say putting in some sort of like weirdly angled right, crosswalk, right? That disrupts it as well, right? But also does a decent job in terms of framing that character's head. So now that maybe there is a narrative that you're developing now. Okay, so your job in your assignment is to do stuff like this. That central space is in anticipation of whatever your focal point is gonna be so that when you insert it in drawing number three, that we know exactly where it is we're looking, but also what the object of importance is. But also in the background, starting to position other objects that might be of secondary importance, tertiary importance, quaternary importance, so that at the very least, None of these things are distracting from that. Thing. That makes sense. Yes. Great. 
this is a nice uh, straightforward easy end of term right uh, class rate because this is all that we need to go over right the rest is just going to be showing you that skyfall example that i wanted you to watch and talking about it because it's not only really good for this class um, but also really good for um, what we're going to do in the second term as well so that we can refer back to it again at, a, or at another point okay so before we just uh, review the assignment, any questions as to what I've gone over here? This is a good page to screenshot. It's not gonna be anything else added to it. Okay, and rather than rewriting all of this stuff, hopefully this makes significantly more sense now. Any questions about your assignment? Okay, well, lucky you guys, because um, this is due next Friday, 9 a.m., because that's when your classes are, right, for the second term. Okay, so you've got a full week and a half to do this. Again, the same sort of caveat as last time. Please don't leave this to the last second and do a shitty job because you've run out of time, right? I know that you guys are overloaded with classes, right? Kind of it because it's the end of term and assignments with the end of term, right? But right, try to at least pick away at this right, in advance so that uh, this doesn't fade off into the nether regions of your brain. This one is the same as like we do the background in two point and then the object in one point and then yeah. put them together. Exactly, right? So to accentuate that focal point, you're gonna draw it in one point so that it stands out from your two-point environment. But the whole oh. environment is in two-point and as much variety as possible, and that focal area is going to be asymmetrically located. Sweet. Okay, so, you know, there's an irresponsibly brief version of an example there. So this one, we don't, we can do different things on both sides because it's natural oh, yeah. and it's not. Yeah, yeah. The more variety, the better, right? So we don't want any repetition on either side of the frame. We want as much variation of size, shape, design, spacing, right, as you can muster. Okay, well, let's just take a, a quick look at um, the handout to make sure that this is absolutely clear. No, that's not the class. No. Okay, and this um and this handout is pretty good for a variety of reasons because it's got not only good examples but also um, examples of what not to do. All right, why won't you? Why won't you just let me do what I want to do? Because you're fucking evil. That's why. Ugh. <laughs> okay so this is all the blah 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 of stuff that we've already gone over right? examples etc right? there's right, your you know, general description right and here's a good example right? again no shading just line drawing all things in two point right? and then you know, what would come in between is obviously a drawing of this person, right? And then there being a focal, or, and then that character being inserted into that focal area that's present. Okay, right? now this character, because it's character, it doesn't obviously associate with a one point, right? That doesn't mean that the one point's not present, but if you're using an object in perspective that you wanted to combine that one point with, that object right, would be in a one point perspective pointing back towards wherever that point is. Now, what's a potential problem? Now knowing what you know about isolation, uniqueness, right, breathing space, et cetera, what's a potentially competing point of focus in this picture? The planter. The planter, where's the planter? Oh no, the house behind the character. The piece of wood. 
I would say it's the hatchet. The hatchet. Right. Now I can see why right, you would say that because the house is silhouetted. Right. Although, you know, the house, it loses value right, because it does have like a repetition of that object. This object here, this section here, certainly, right, we could disrupt that a little bit more. But the object itself is leaning up against something as well. Right? The hatchet, though, look at what, right, how it's creating or how it might create a sense of focus. First off, it's isolated in a very similar way right, to this character. What else is it? Where is it in the frame? It's exactly in the middle. It's exactly in the middle. So your brain is naturally kind of associating these two things with each other. Even though this portion of the hatchet is overlapped, the fact that the handle right, is so clearly silhouetted, you know, it's like it makes it look like we're telling a story about you know, a peasant that has recently chopped wood or is about to chop wood, right, et cetera. And that's not a bad thing. Like this is something that you can definitely do. But if this isn't the intention that you're trying to create inside your picture, this is why it's so important to control this stuff because your brain your, is naturally going to want to construct that story. Right? And if you don't want to tell that story, now it's a problem for the message that you're trying to send. So an easy way of taking care of that would be put another object in behind here. You wouldn't even have to move its position. You could take this whole thing and shuffle it over or shuffle it up a little bit so that it was overlapping the background as well. Like there's a variety of things that you can do and they're not difficult things to do, but you, there needs to be an awareness of those things, right? In order for you to do them, right? And then this one, right? Outside of the fact that this is in value, which I don't want your assignment to do, right? This is a really good one, right? Whereas uh, you've got this isolated, right? Underneath something that's conspicuously, uh, conspicuously empty. And then everything else is overlapped in a way that depreciates the values of those things. Right. If anything, it's like you can make a really nitpicky argument for, say, maybe overlapping this thing as well by putting, say, like another ventilation grate or something like that in behind it. It doesn't really matter what you do. Right. It also right, doesn't really make sense, like the perspective of this either. But again, right, again, getting nitpicky right, on this. OK, so those are pretty two or two pretty good examples, although please do not shade your assignment. I want your assignment again to look like this in terms of it's just a line drawing. Okay, now, um, I wanna talk about Skyfall example, cause it's a, it's a really good example for a variety of ways. And not the least of which is that it's almost a textbook version of what it is that we've just talked about. because it's so obvious what they do. Just trying to uh, scrub forward too. Some place where it's closer. Oops. Okay, so let's see how well I do with finding it this time. Okay, so this is what I mean by a silhouette, just in case there's any confusion is the outline of that character. So all you're relying on when you're dealing with the silhouette, and this will be the focus of next week, is what's the design of that outline so that that outline tells you what that object is. Don't worry about that this week, but this is something that you wanna, you will have to focus on eventually. So if you wanna bring that to bear on this assignment, then that's, then that's great. That's why breathing space is so important, is that it makes that silhouette more easily separable from its environment. Now, what that breathing space is, is nicely identified by, oh, oh no. There. So this sequence. That, right there. 
Now, what they've done here, right, is basically broken the frame up into smaller and smaller frames. And this is a bit of a confusing um, concept sometimes, right, because it's not an intuitive way of thinking. But what I'd like you to think of, right, is that the frame is just one frame amongst many that we're taking advantage of potentially inside of a scene, right? So most obviously, the frame that we're taking advantage of is the overall frame. That's a controlling device and we're all stuck with it. But there's lots of different ways of breaking that frame up so that you can direct visual traffic towards different areas. One way, the one way that they break this frame up is by doing this, right? So they've taken this foreground chunk of space, this building, right? And then hacked it off from this mid-ground and background chunk of space. So now that building itself becomes something that's separate from this chunk of space over here in the frame. Another really obvious thing that they've done is taken this frame and made that frame basically a reflection of the entire frame right, that further funnels your attention towards that area. And then inside that frame, they've literally put the Looney Tune circle right, inside the center of the frame. To the point where, you know, it's like Porky Pig, Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, Bugs Bunny, whoever, right, can quite easily poke their head up out of that place. And if, if that wasn't enough, they put an even smaller frame inside there. Right, so this, all of this does is it leads the anticipation of the viewer to understand that something is going to be inserted into that space. So that when we see this character sit down inside that space, we're hardly surprised, right? That that's where that is, right? And you can see it's like how clearly that character is silhouetted because of that blank environment, as opposed to this character who's obviously important, but now she's confused by the stuff that she's walking in front of. This character is less important because they're off in the background behind a chair, cropped by that thing, cropped by her. Right? This character is behind other stuff, also in front of other stuff. And the further you get out to the peripheral edges of the frame, the less important things become psychologically for us. And again, there's a variety of ways of doing this, right? But this is like a really easy way. And look at the immediate difference between that character's importance as soon as that sheet gets removed. They're no longer as important because now they're obstructed by the painting in behind them. And if anything, the painting becomes more important because it's in the frame. But when we're developing focus, what we're essentially doing is a way more subtle version of this. You're just putting crosshairs over top of something that we all recognize in terms of the pattern. That's a very good way right, of identifying what the focal point of the picture is. And as a result, being immediately able to identify. Now, this isn't, again, going to be something that you always want to do, but it is a crucial tool to do so that you can develop right, these, or these points of importance in your picture when you need to. The other thing that um, we're going to look at next week is this fight sequence here because it's a very good example of how to use silhouette, control silhouette as a way of increasing intensity to a story. Right, so that simplified design is what I would like you to think about in relationship to your picture this week because when we come back to look at this example next week right how they control the design and how they control the designs of those things in relationship to each other has a huge part with how effective that particular sequence is right and you know like bond movies or not right what you can't say about bond movies is that they don't have a pile of money and talent thrown at it right so irrespective of the ridiculousness of these movies right in a lot of ways what they are really done or what they are done right for the most part is really well in terms of how they're shot right how they're conceived of in terms of arranging those shots so that they're getting you to understand in as clear a way as possible 
what you're supposed to understand from each individual frame. Okay, so as promised, that is my borderline irresponsibly short class for you today as an end of term gift. Um, that we should free up hopefully some much needed time for you guys to do your end of term assignments for the rest of today, et cetera. Now, that being said, um, any redo that, did I say the redos were due today? I did, okay, so all of your redos are due today with the exception of the assignment that you handed in for today. You've got until here next week to hand that in, okay? And then this assignment, I will give you until the first class of the second term to redo it as well. Um, that is it, that is all, other than individual questions from you guys. So do you guys have any, and do you guys have any questions that are specific towards the assignment and the subject that we've gone over today? Okay, um, well then, 